Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah great. So um, as you said, I'm Mike Anita Hausen, and I am here at OHSU. I'm working as a biostatistician, and I'm going to talk about some work I've done through the Knight Cardiovascular Institute here. Um, and so wearable activity tracker data, you can think about your Fitbit, although we worked with what's called the basis peak um, device, if you've heard of that. Um, so uh, here's a brief outline, um, but basically talking about um, we had a large set of data, how can we visualize this data, and really especially with in mind helping our collaborators, collaborators and clients understanding the data. Um, so the name of the study was the U24-7 study. We had 431 participants all working at the same workplace that commissioned the study. It was about 60% male. They were all fairly healthy. Average age was around 41, so fairly young. It was a six-month study. So what we had was for 431 people, minute-by-minute minute data for about six months. Um, in addition, they had completed at baseline and end of studies, some surveys, and we had things like their height, weight, blood pressure, beginning and end, um, lipids, and other blood test results, and also electronic health records. So first, just what's in this data. Here are some examples. Um, on the top, what you see is the heart rate per minute. So this is just one person, um, and this is over 10 days. And you can see um, what they call body states. And so the problem with the basis peak was they didn't tell us how they actually calculated body states. And so we have to infer a little bit. But for example, in turquoise, you have sleep. So yeah, OK, they're going to sleep at night. But somehow the device is calculating it, and they're not telling us. But we do have a sleep state. Then there's an inactive state in blue. And one thing we did figure out is, well, if you're in inactive states, you don't have any steps. So the middle plot, you see steps per minute. And so you can see there, when it's dark blue, you don't have any steps per minute. Um, then we have a light body state and a moderate activity state. And so people working with um, physical activity, studying it, they're in particular interested in that moderate activity. So we're interested in inactivity, and we're interested in moderate or vigorous. We unfortunately don't have a vigorous state with this device. We just have moderate. So at the top, you have your heart rate per minute, in the middle, steps per minute, and on the bottom is also calories per minute. And again, we don't know how they're calculating calories per minute. And we haven't really worked much with cal the calories, just because it was something we're like not entirely sure what's um, going on with the variables. Um, steps seems to be pretty safe, though. Um, even with heart rate per minute, it was sampled more frequently than that. It's just the device only saves a per minute value. So again, we don't know, well, how did it calculate a heart rate per minute exactly? But so this just gives you a sense of what's going on with the device. There's also off-risk times, and sometimes people are actually taking it off. And other times, we saw what we call jiggling. So here's 24 hours for a person. The top is the heart rate. And you can see there's lots of orange on the bottom there. And it's like, this is jiggling. This is not, you know, you wouldn't take it off multiple times in an hour for short periods of time. And the watch is fairly heavy. And so that's a phenomenon we saw happen with some people. And so something that we're a little concerned with um, when analyzing data, especially heart rate. Um, we found some interesting things in the study. Here's a highly active person. So if you compare it to this previous slide, so remember purple is that high activity, moderate activity. This person regularly runs um, almost every day. And um, this person was also highly impressive. They got 132,000 steps in one day. And I thought that was an error until I actually looked at that day. And I'm like, well, you have the heart rates to support it. You have the time series of steps to support it. I really thought it was a mistake until I saw this. I'm like, wow. Um, we called her Wonder Woman, actually. Kind of fitting this weekend. <laughs> um, so there are fun things that popped out of the data like this. Um, so for 12 hours, some kind of ultra marathon, and then you can see after that, she slept for quite a while. <laughs> so, so that was kind of fun to see that in the data. Now, um, I do have code interspersed here just so you can look at it. I'm not going to go through the details since I don't have time, but if you're interested in, oh, how did she create those plots? 
then you can take a look at the code, and I'm happy to answer questions about code later. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in was the trend over the study, um, and we had what we called the Thanksgiving effect, because uh, it was the like beginning of summer to end of fall, and um, in general, there was a downward trend in steps per day. And one of the ways we classified it, uh, people's activity was looking at, did you reach 5,000 steps or 10,000 steps? And really, we just fit regression lines on everybody and looked at where did you end and where did you start? So in the first um, row are people who started below 5,000 steps per day. And what I mean by that is where did your individual regression line that predicted values start? And then where did you end? Um, and so you can see on the bottom left corner, there's somebody who was really ambitious at the beginning and then just went really low. Um, I like to remind my investigate, like collaborators though, like, okay, I can fit regression lines, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what they did. And so if you look at this slide, these are their actual study getting plots. And it's like, well, this is really what the activity was. It wasn't necessarily a line, and a line might not even be the best fit. It just gives us a way to assess what's your slope as a rate of change and things like that. Um, this graph I just kept because I spent so much time on it. Um, <laughs> and just to show that, yeah, you know what, VGplot, you can actually make some nice graphs and add lots of different things. So the idea of adding layers to a plot in ggplot, this is just one person. Um, and we looked at classifying trends in different ways, and I was trying to put all that together in one plot for the collaborators. Um, again, to a non-technical audience, like what is the slope of a regression line? What do we actually mean for that? Um, here's the code for the, this plot, again, if you're interested in seeing that. The other thing is when we talked about slopes of those lines, you know, are they actually significant? And again, with in mind to the collaborators, like, well, just because you have a big positive or negative slope, it doesn't mean it's significant. And so I made this for them just so they could see, like, if you have a significant slope, so those are the top ones in salmon and purple, your slope might be the same as somebody for whom it was non-significant. So just like reminding them, like, what does it really mean to be significant? And it depends a lot on the variability that went around that. Um, so there's the code for that if you're interested. Now there are interested in associations between steps and moderate activity and inactivity and all these things. And also now starting to bring in other information about the individuals. What was their gender? What was their BMI? And so here, um, the left plot we see on the y-axis moderate activity, so average minutes per week in moderate. So that was that highest body states versus on the x-axis hours per day inactive. And so you can see, well, the more inactive you are, the less moderate activity you tend to have, as we expect. Um, and then, you know, they're interested, though, well, how does that relationship hold when you bring in things like BMI and gender? And so ggplot let me do that. I could put different symbols. I can put different colors. Um, the, uh, here's one with sleep. You can see there's not much relationship between sleep and moderate activity. Um, studying the sleep data is a whole separate project that I'm not going to focus on. But instead of using the colors and the shapes, I could also, oh shoot, I didn't have that in here, I took it out. You could also just do separate trend lines and start using faceting. Um, and so I did a lot of that, like facet by BMI and facet by gender, for example, and then have separate trend lines. Now they're also interested in correlations with those cardiometabolic risk factors. Um, so we looked at variables like BMI, waist, waist-hip ratio, and weight. Um, and then uh, you also have steps, the physical activity variables. Um, and we started building regression models with all of these. And the cardiometabolic risk factors were the um, response variables in our models. But just to show them, well, how strongly correlated or uncorrelated are these variables? I started like ha realizing like oh I got to build lots and lots of plots and um, so with ggplot it's like well I can facet but I realize what I need to facet by like on the top row you can see I have a variable that has age steps moderate activity and inactivity in it so I had 
to make my data long with respect to those variables, but so that I could facet by the BMI waste, waste hip ratio, and weight. Also, I needed to then make the data long with respect to that. So I was doing a lot of what I call doubly long data, basically. And at first, it seemed kind of tedious, and I, you know, it took me a while to get used to doing this, but once I got used to it, I'm like, wow, this is a really quick way to make a ggplot and take advantage of the faceting, just make super long data. Um, so that's uh, what, how I created this plot. Um, and then we have the same thing again uh, for things like their blood pressure and cholesterol, glucose, HbA1c. And you can actually see here the red p-values. You can't see those p-values where you're sitting, but the red is for the significant ones. Um, and then the black is insignificant. So there's much higher relationship between your activity and inactivity with your things like your BMI, your body composition, than your clinical outcome. Um, then finally, this last part. Um, so if you were at the PER workshop this morning and the idea of mapping, this is what I used to create these. So I was building a lot of regression models for them. They were interested in modeling, as I was saying, things like your uh, clinical outcomes and then comparing it, well, I want to stratify by age and gender and BMI. And in this particular project, we are comparing Caucasians and South Asians. We had a large South Asian population um, in our sample. So looking at those relationships and um, to help convince them that well, maybe we should be looking at interactions in the models, I built both of these sets so they can see well, what does it mean to not have an interaction in the model, meaning I'm going to force all the slopes to be the same, versus now I introduce an interaction and we can start seeing different relationships. Um, inactivity, especially with ethnicity, more so than steps and your moderate activity was influential when comparing the South Asians and Caucasians. Um, so, for example, if you look at... Um, like your LDL, as your level of inactivity increases for the Caucasians, I'm like sure there was a slight decrease in LDL, it wasn't significant though, but LDL really went up as your activity increased for the South Asians. So the South Asians um, were much more like, affected by inactivity. And so that's something you wouldn't see without the interaction. Um, so how did I create these? Well, I first create the plots, I first nested the data. Um, I had the data, and I'll look at this um, a little bit. Uh, so I first had to make the data long, and um, so again, this idea of making it doubly long, because I have all these different variables going on, because the inactivity was going to the model, but I also had lots of not only was I doing activity, I had separate models with steps and I had separate models with moderate activity. So that's one variable to make it long by and then another variable for all the outcomes, your clinical outcomes. So that's the first thing, I had to make it doubly long. And then I nested it, so that's what you see. I don't know if this was here. On the bottom there, you can see the nesting. And so there I grew by the type of physical activity and the variable. So here's a screenshot of the nested data, um, so a table. And um, then I have a separate data set for each of those. So I had separate data sets for the steps, and then for each steps I had a separate data set for systolic, diastolic, and so on. And then once I had that, I just created functions for my regression models. These were, sim these were simple linear regressions, multiple regressions. And then in my nested models, I then mutated, so this is similar to what we were looking at in the PER, I mapped those functions, here we go, I mapped those functions I just created. And so if you look at the output, you now see there's a column for the linear models with the interaction and one without the interaction. And so I then also had to map the predicted values once I had the models. And honestly, the, at the end, the code to create the plots is super short, just a couple of lines, once you have all of that. I did have to unnest the data once I was done. Um, but it was definitely worth the effort, because I was running all the models anyways to get all the coefficients. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip this, because I'm out of time. My collaborator from Australia, he calls this the bushfire plot. Um, but. Uh, 
The, so my main collaborators were from the Knight Cardiovascular Institute, especially Luke Birch Hill, and there is a huge team working on this that you can see listed. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Uh, was there any results that really surprised you uh, once you guys finished the analysis? Um, I think the most interesting so far has been the uh, Caucasian versus South Asian comparisons. Um, the drawback of the data is they were essentially all fairly healthy. So when you know, you're looking at all these risk factors and activity, how does activity affect them? It's like, well, they're all kind of fairly healthy. Um, we, I mean, there is the problem with some of the outliers, like the Wonder Woman I showed you, where you're like, wow, this person is just way off the charts compared to everybody else. So there are a few, like, surprising people in the data set, but in terms of general results, I think the Caucasian versus South Asians was some of the most interesting.